stage is all yours professor namrata and dr bal subramanian thank you gopal and welcome uh, dr balu once again and welcome to all our participants uh, who have made time today evening to attend this very interesting book talk uh, this is a part of the jsw school of public policy book talk series and today we are extremely fortunate to have dr balu talk about his latest book i the citizen unraveling the power of citizen engagement uh, before we uh, hand over the stage to dr balu i would like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce him there is so much that he's done so please pardon me if i sort of just focus on um, a few things here Uh, so he has worked extensively in the development sector and has spent a significant part of his working uh, life in forest based tribal communities in southern india in the district of mysuru and uh, he of course as you uh, many of you may know he's trained as a medical doctor uh, after which he earned his mphil in hospital administration and health systems management from bitspilani and thereafter after spending a, a long time dedicating his life uh, to medical service and later uh, to to civil society service he went on to pursue his masters in public administration at the harvard kennedy school as a mason fellow and uh, he was greatly influenced by the teachings of swami vivekanand and at the age of 19 he founded the swami vivekanand youth movement and uh, later on he also went on to found and uh, be the chairperson of the grassroots and advocacy movement or gram as he calls it um uh, and he you know he's also a very well known uh, academic and he is uh, a tata scholar uh, as i mentioned he was a mason fellow and was also, also a fellow at the hauser center for civil society at uh, harvard university and currently he is a visiting professor at cornell university and at iit delhi and where uh, and he teaches courses on leadership and human development and also he coaches and mentors uh, senior leaders in nonprofit uh, sector the corporate sector government sector and most importantly also the educational uh, sectors he has written extensively so this is uh, one of his seven books that he's written uh, and he writes both in english and in kannada uh, and i will also just like to say a few things about what we should uh, expect here uh, in terms of a very exciting talk here so i had the opportunity uh, to read the book and i found it very fascinating because uh, the book at the core of it is a very important question so what is it uh, you know what is our role as citizens what does democracy mean most importantly i think the question around what development itself means who should define it and who are the real stakeholders in it and while many of us including my self in public policy we talk about of course the government being uh, the main provider uh, but we also i think many a times limit ourselves to just engaging with the private sector very few in the public policy uh, circles actually talk about civil society engagement and how that helps uh, in bringing about uh, development as dr balu uh, describes it and also making sure that the services that we are expecting as citizens are actually you know reaching the citizens so now i'll hand over the stage uh, to dr balu so we have uh, plenty of time uh, we have 90 minutes so we'll let you uh, you know take your time in talking about the book and then at least leave maybe 20 to 30 minutes for q and a I was hoping that you'll start off with the Q and A, and you'll ask me questions about the book. I oh, if you want to do that, I can. <laughs> we'll, we'll try that. Let's do that. Okay, so let's do that. So my question, um, I know I have I have a I have a few, but I think I'll start with one, uh, which I always think about a lot, and especially coming, uh, you know, from a, from a country where we tend to take democracy. you know for granted but one of the things uh, which you also talk you know democracy and how to make democracy work and you have a lot of vignettes around that so one of the assumptions of democracy and and a lot of thinkers have also um, said this is that it assumes that people are capable of making 
informed decision. So we are not talking about any rational decision making here. We are just talking about people being able to make informed decisions. And when you say informed decisions, there are further assumptions that you would expect people to have certain levels of education, uh, people to have, you know, they're not being um, information asymmetry around, uh, you know, how exactly uh, the candidates are presenting themselves and so on and so forth. So my question is really around when, when that's the kind of assumption that democracy is making, um, how exactly are we supposed to be making it work? Because that's a big assumption in a country like India still. Uh, so that is a question that I will leave you with uh, and also leave you with to begin your presentation. So I'll possibly start out with the presentation because the answer to your questions and the webinar by itself. Uh, but I'm going to uh, uh, essentially start talking about the journey of why the book, even, why even talk about it or why even write about it or why the title I the citizen because uh, I was hoping that the first thing that somebody would ask is why is the I in small letters? Uh, and a lot of people have asked me that question across the world whenever I talk on this book. So I'll start off with that first and then explain why the book and why I didn't even bother to write it. Well, the small I is because I always believe that um, a citizen should subsume his ego and his role into the larger construct of the nation state. And so the I is not about me being the citizen, but about me being a very small part of a larger system of people, a network of people, and, and, and remind myself or any citizen of the role that I have to play in, in, in moving this larger nation state forward. So that's the, uh, I'm beginning with the title, but why the book? So I want to start off with that and sort of ask myself a question and start off with why the book, why bother to write? Everybody seems to think they know about what they have to do. Uh, like, like, Namrata said in the introduction, um, the whole my my journey started off as a physician wanting to change India's healthcare system. So as all of 19, when I started this Vivekananda movement, thinking that you know I can have a magic wand, I can be the next Albert Schweitzer, and the world will be at my feet and possibly a Nobel Prize in my pocket. So we have this ideological dream thinking that you can change the world. Uh, and being a physician and being inspired by Vivekananda, I thought. Uh, going and living in our villages is a good start. So I went there. I still remember the immediate on graduation, I went to this area called Brahmagiri in the Bandipur National Park area of Karnataka. And uh, people hardly cared. People wouldn't even care a damn about my presence because medicine was not, not what they wanted. And they wouldn't even believe that I could be a doctor who could be there. And people thought that I haven't completed my medicine. So I just Maybe didn't clear, didn't, didn't have enough intelligence to clear the exam. So I just came there as a half prepared quack to work with the tribals because people don't expect you to serve. Because we live in a cynical system where people expect to uh, ascribe ulterior motives to you. And I was no exception to that. But then after some time, you start, and I had actually topped the, you know, nearly topped the university. I stood third in the university in medicine final year. And I thought, you know what? I'd given up so much to be here, and these guys don't care a damn about you. Because we seek affirmation, we seek to be recognized, we seek to be seen and heard. Here I thought, here I am coming here to serve all my life being born and brought up in Bangalore and people don't even care about your presence. So I was desperately hoping that somebody would fall sick. Somebody would be sick enough to need a doctor. And then I can prove that I'm actually a doctor. So around this time, in that phase of my life, when I was really thinking a lot about myself and I thought I could really do something, a very painful incident, and I actually written about this in my second book, in Voices from the Grass, of the, or the sixth book, I would say, uh, or second in the series. Voices in the Voices from the Grass so is one section in I the Citizen, which prompted me to actually write deeper about it and about the voices people don't listen to. And so, this uh, the first chapter of that book is what I call the voice that keeps me going, and even today it's that voice which keeps me going in whatever I do. So I was there, I suddenly got to know that uh, there's a, pre a lady in labor in one of the tribal colonies. We call The colonies are named after the chieftains and this particular chieftain was called Sani Madaya. His daughter, Sani Madaya's daughter in Sani Madana Hadi, Hadi is a hamlet in the local language, was pregnant. And I thought, wow, thank God she's pregnant and now I can go there, check on her. And if I deliver the chieftain's daughter, my acceptance is complete. The tribal community would say, oh, this man is really a doctor. He can actually do this stuff. So I went there. I still remember that evening. 
I go to that house of Sani Madhaya and I convince that young woman to come out. And I then see she's not even a woman; she's a girl. She's a 14-year-old girl. And in tribal societies, then things have changed. Now I'm talking of close to 36, 37 years ago. She had; uh, they just live together. They have sex. They live together. They get pregnant. They get pregnant. And this girl had got pregnant, and she was in labor. It was primary gravida. So in first first labor, normally it takes 24 hours as per textbooks to progress. So we thought. I thought that. It's early labor, so I may not have much to do. So I said, let me come back tomorrow morning. Came back. It's a forest area. It's a project tiger area. I didn't want to become the meal for some tiger, so I just came back that night. And next morning, I set out again. I had a little leather bag. I still remember. I used to carry it like this old movies. And then I went there. And on the way, uh, I remember a very elderly tribal woman stopped me and then said, "Where are you going so early?" And I told her, "I'm going to deliver Madi." Madhi was a child's name, and she said, "You don't have to go. Madhi delivered last night." Now, half my life shattered at that point of time. I said, "What the hell? Here I was looking at this opportunity to deliver, and then this this girl had to have this baby last night. Why couldn't she follow the textbook and allow 24 hours to go by?" But then I thought, somehow I need to do it, show that I'm a doctor. And the only other way I could remember was go put some. Antibiotic drops in the child's eyes, the newborn's eyes, and some gentian violet. We used to actually get a chemical called gentian violet those days. I don't think doctors today would even hear that, know that word. It is it's an antiseptic compound. We would apply it on the umbilical stump. It still works, but we all want expensive things nowadays. So this is a very cheap chemical which is to take care of infection. So I thought, let me apply gentian violet and come. I went there, and I'm standing at the hut of that lady. Standing outside, and tri- traditional custom was you don't enter the colony or the tribal colony without the chieftain's permission, as much as you don't enter the house without the lady's permission. So I'm standing at the door and asking this. I could, I could, I distinctly heard the person inside. I could know she was there inside. She was moving around, and then I asked, "I would like to see the child." Three, four minutes of negotiation, nothing happened. But I know that person is there. But absolute silence. You know, something like talking to a wall, and you're not having any response. Seven eight minutes of this, I started getting frustrated. You know, human ego takes over. I was 22 years old. I thought, oh, I'm a doctor. I'm a distinction student. I've given up so much and come to the forest. And this little woman doesn't even want to come out and show me a child. So when I was getting angry, I burst out and said, if you're not going to come out to the baby, I'm going to get into the house, how hut and see your child anyway. And then I heard that, that scream still is a scream in my ears even today. She said she screamed and said, please don't come into my house. I have nothing to wear. So this is 1987, and 40 years out of so-called socio-economic uh, political freedom that we got. I don't know if we ever got socio-economic freedom, but this child who delivered her own baby. During the delivery, she had soiled the only sari she had while delivering the placenta. After delivering the baby, and the placenta was uh, expelled. She washes the soiled sari, put it on top of the hut, and she is waiting for the sun to come out for it to dry to wrap herself again. That 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 is something which has, that affected my life and continues to affect my life even now. How do we in a nation which worships Durga, Sita, all the all the goddesses we can think of, ever con, con, concede that a woman at a girl at fourteen can get pregnant first of all, and then if she gets pregnant, she actually delivers herself and then has nothing to cover herself up. So it was something which is unacceptable to me, and and that's the first time it hit me that if this is what India is, there's something I need to do about it. And so my journey started off thinking that what I needed to do about it at that point of time, I thought was build hospitals, build schools, take care of all those issues. So my construct of development started off exactly like how most of us think of development. So I thought, I thought, let me build a school, let me build hospitals. So I ended up 20, spending 20, 15, 20 years of my life building all this stuff, mobile clinics and women's groups and livelihood centers and stuff like that. But eventually, I realized that uh, you know. uh we, we are all uh, uh our journeys happen in different ways and for me my 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 journey was i thought development is all about all this but that is a na- traditional narrative human development is all about buildings and airports and uh highways and toilets and schools and colleges and nothing wrong in that i subscribed to that too at that point of time so built all that few years after that maybe 5 6 years of it went by settled well known Build a great institution, and then I asked this question. I, I had this troubling feeling: Am I really making a difference? Are we really even um, 
changing things the way they are? Or is it just that people fall sick? I treat them, they go back, they fall sick, they come back, I treat them, they go back. So what changes? I thought I need to find answers. And that's when I thought, I let me do a program in public health. Then I went and did a program in health systems management. Then I thought, no, these are not found me answers. So let me go to the Mecca of development. I went to Kennedy School. And I realized that Kennedy School also didn't have answers. But what Kennedy School did to me, I keep uh, crediting them for this, is help me frame questions differently. And I started discovering that most of the answers were embedded in my consciousness. Most of the answers were embedded in my experiences. Most of the answers were embedded in the way I had interacted with people and learned from people around me, which I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen the power of what people know, whom we dismiss off as ordinary, whom we say that, oh, these are poor, they don't have any idea. So I suddenly recognized that there's so much knowledge embedded in me, not because I knew them, but because experiences by interacting with people around me, the poorest of the poor, the tribals, had taught me so much. And I was feeling that I should do something about it. Around that time, a young friend of mine who used to work with me, uh, he mentioned that, uh, why don't you just start writing about it as a blog? Those are the times when blogging had started. And I said, okay, let me do it. I was at Harvard at that time. I said, okay, not at least some time to spend. Let me start blogging about it. And I started writing them as blog articles. And... Uh, the blog articles became quite popular. And incidentally, one of my own classmates at Harvard who was a famous Hollywood actor. And she had a book of her own and she was very well known. And she started reading my blog for some strange reason. And then one day she met me in class and said, you just can't let this be on your blog. If I can write a book, so can you. And she pushed me and said, you have to get this book out. So she actually introduced me to a publisher, and an agent, to everybody and said, they are going to do that now. But then, you know, development doesn't, it's not sexy. It's not, I'm not a glamorous Hollywood actor to convince a literary agent to take it up. So I actually ended up uh, finding people asking me to write what they wanted and not agreeing to publish what I had written. So in a strange way, I came back and I said, well, that's when I started Gram and said, if the world is not going to hear what I'm saying through a channel that already exists, let me publish it to the channel I can control and convene. And so Graham published I the Citizen. I had no idea that the book could become as popular as it was. It came, it's now six years since the book actually formally came out. Another colleague of mine, Rohit Chetty, was in Graham at that time. He kept egging me and said, you know, we shouldn't get this correct. We should get this book out. And that's how it actually became. He put it together, edited it, and then we thought, well, this is a great uh, way of putting it all together. Let's see whether the thoughts make sense. And the book flowered out into a series of uh, ideas, like we brought in understanding development. And like Namrata said, we spoke about democracy and governance. And I wrote about right to information. And we wrote about public policy. And we wrote about uh, voices from the grassroots and how these voices are not heard and how they should be presented. So a series of sections became the book. And when it got published, it got released in several cities. It was released in the Prime Minister's office here in Delhi. Uh, it became quite popular around the world. Cornell republished it. Uh, Cornell University Press published it as a global edition. And I said, people started reaching out to me and telling me it's a textbook for the course. They would ask me to speak about it. Then I suddenly realized there are actually readers for this book. Because when, when you write, and I write it in the foreword or preface there in the book itself, I said, I didn't write for anybody to read. I wrote it more as an expression of preserving my sanity, you know. The world doesn't understand development. The world is so confused. If I thought development was finding, building a hospital for Madi, it didn't solve Madi's problem, but uh, it might have facilitated her life. So we all have programs to cope with poverty. We think human development is about economic growth. So I, I fundamentally challenged that narrative and said human development is not about all that. Human development is about understanding how it's a constant expansion of human capabilities and in a deconstructed way, the theory of change I fashioned was, how do you invest and build human and social capital for people, which will have enormous economic consequences? So what started off as an expression to preserve my sanity became a very popular book. And um, I think three or four prints have already gone by. Uh, I now realize, I was just telling Gopal that uh, some of my own young colleagues who work with me uh, I read the book, not officially, but pirated versions of it. And so my son had an nice way of putting it. He said, your book must have really become famous. If it's famous enough to be pirated, then maybe it is famous. So that is the definition of famous nowadays. And, you know, I remember when I wrote the book, somebody told me, if you sell a thousand copies, 
in India, it's considered a bestseller. Uh, several thousands of copies have been sold, but more importantly, I think it is an opportunity to tell the world, we need to ask ourselves difficult questions. In a post-COVID world, where we literally created all kinds of crises, some the ecological crisis or the social economic inequity is a crisis or the crisis of the self where we don't even understand ourselves well today. Uh, in a world where capitalism is possibly not interpreted and utilized and applied in the way it should be, uh, where we, capitalism needs to be humanized, needs to be made compassionate, economy has to be transitioned into the, into the most soulful one where we understand human development for people like Madhi in a forest has to be something which is beyond just uh, taking care of a newborn or getting her to deliver in a safe environment. It is something about building Madhi's capability so that she doesn't get pregnant at 14 in the first place. She makes choices that are wise. So enabling freedom of choice and getting these questions asked of policy makers, of policy teachers, of bureaucrats, of the political system. I think in some strange sense, looking back now in six years, this book seems to be um, reaching out to those audiences, whether it's making an impact, I don't know. But that's how the book started. And so now coming back to your question, I thought I need to give this background because uh, democracy to me was something very fascinating. And uh, I started running campaigns called Making Democracy Work. And, um, whether the chapters on corruption comes out because of my work with the local act of Karnataka or I was part of Team Anna and the anti-corruption struggles that we had and then my reason to exit, I've written all that in the book or using institutional mechanisms like the National Human Rights Commission to fight for rights of people. So how constitutional means can be actually uh, negotiated for people's benefit. All that is part of this book. So democracy is a very strange way and like uh, I, I'm, I think the Churchill who said, you know, Unless you have a better form of government, democracy may not be the best, but let me do it. Let me just use it. I, I still feel uh, India is not, uh, we haven't learned a democracy from the Greeks or from the Western nations. I think India has had its own way of democratized governance in se several, several methods, though we used to call it monarchy, but they had an embedded governance structure, which is also democratically run. So a lot of examples over there, but democracy works only when citizens engage. And citizens can engage only when they feel empowered enough to engage. And empowerment, like you said, is a very dicey game. Empowerment is double-edged for the system, which it doesn't, it will not want to make an investment in empowerment. So the beginning of the journey for a citizen, the way I recognized and realized it is, first is enlightenment. Enlightening ourselves about the fact that there is an information asymmetry. Today we have a right to information. I write about it in I, the citizen, how to use right information, how ordinary people have used it. And the book itself is like a story. It's about real life incidents of people who actually live these experiences. And that's why it actually works. Some of the people who read the book have told me that when they read it, they feel they're there. Because most of us have gone through this experience. It's not, it's not new for us. I just put it together as a book. But we've all had these journeys and, and, and real democracy is not about the electoral systems that we see or the voting that we make. That is just a representative form of democracy. And you really can't have 700, 800 people in parliament representing a nation of 130 crores or 135 crores. So that is just a representation. But the real democracy is a participatory democracy, which needs to be a, a next level of evolution, where if you have to make a democracy or a country healthy, there's a lot of investments to be made on it. And the only investment you can make is the state itself. I see the state, I see four powerful forces in play every time. One force, if you can make it a box and have four boxes, uh, a, a square with four boxes inside. One box is a political leadership box. Now in a democracy, you elect the political leadership, but the, next, the box which elects it is the citizens or the people of the country. And this political leadership creates the rules. They make the legislative mechanisms to kind of work it out. And the legislative mechanisms are enforced by institutions they put up. So it's a tension between these four forces. The citizens putting pressure on the elect elected body to actually frame the rules that citizens require. And the elected body, after framing the rules, create the institutions to deliver on the rules for the citizens themselves. Now, even if one of these mechanisms are weak, democracy fails. And today, different forces hijack different elements. Either the institutional mechanisms are so powerful and strong, they hijack it off. And we saw this happening when, uh, though everybody credits uh, Session with the great transition of election commission, but in a sense, it was, it was, it was hijacked away by his power and glory, which he, he didn't even deliver as a cabinet secretary. 
that institution was not really successful, but as an alternate institution, but that actually is also not healthy for democracy. It has to be a balance of these four forces. Citizens have given up because citizens find it more comfortable to negotiate the citizenship control and power in an election for petty pecuniary gain. That's how the votes get sold. The electoral system are no longer worried about losing the elections because they are not delivered. They are worried about losing the elections if they are not made enough money to pay the voter to elect them. So they create, they create, make rules which not necessarily are responding to citizens' requirements, but making rules which perpetuates their glory, power, and their money-making abilities. So we are actually moving away. And look at any country for that matter. If you look at the previous Trump administration and the early laws that he passed, actually benefited most of his cabinet members more than actually the citizens of the United States and tax exemptions that he gave. So once you capture the narrative, any one box or any one force captures the narrative, it skews it in one direction. And every society is in transition, depending on the strength and power of the box that we're controlling. I believe when citizens transition into what I call the authorizing environment, when they authorize a good environment by electing right people, and these right people are held to accountable uh, processes and deliverables by the citizens themselves, they'll create the right, they'll make the right laws, and then put in place institutions which actually deliver to the citizens. So it's a constant play of several forces that has to be my opinion, it better be skewed. And I'm a full disclosure, I'm, I'm biased towards being, being skewed towards an authorizing environment called the citizen. And that is why this book is I the citizen. We have to authorize the environment to run our lives. We have to take control of the narrative shaping our development destinies. We have to decide that it is not the government which can tell me how to live, but it is me who's going to tell the government how to make laws to help me live the life I want to lead. I'm not saying in an irresponsible way, I'm saying it in a responsibly, well thought through way of thinking. It's a negotiated settlement of the system that operates. If they're truly people elected from my kind, from the citizens, and this is the voice that they need to take to parliament and create these institutions. A long answer number of but I thought it needed this background to explain what I believe in. No, I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate uh, the background. And I, I must say this, uh, you know, aside from, of course, uh, your response to the to the question that I posed, uh, I must say, after having read your book, I hope I can pick up some storytelling skills myself. You know, it's, it's really fascinating, I completely agree with the readers and your colleagues who said we feel like we were there. Uh, so, so every vignette, every anecdote, it, it truly feels that, you know, you're living the experience um, as you read it. Uh, so, so kudos to you uh, on that. And thank you again uh, for the response. So, yes, I, you know, I agree. It's, it's that the process and I like how you call it negotiation. Um, you know, somebody can call it debate, deliberation, but yeah, negotiation is uh, another way to, to describe the entire democratic process. Um, so thank you. Uh, so do you think we should just open it up or would you have uh, anything more to add uh, before we open it up to audience? You know, I, I just thought a few things I thought I'd share because I'm sure some of your uh, policy, potential policy students or your management students will also be there. I always have been worried about university education. Though I teach in an Ivy League or in one of the best institutions in India, and I teach Delhi, my concern has always been we train people to believe they're damn good. We get them into the best, they get into IIM Ahmedabad, their life is made. So we say you got into the best management school, you have got into the best place, you have the best faculty teaching you, we give you the A pluses and let people go out into the world believing they're damn good. So we train people to believe they're competent. What we don't train people is to act from zones of incompetence. Now, to me, leadership is enabling people to understand their own incompetence and learn how to cope with it and act out of that space. And therefore, in that urge to become better, acquire the competence to make yourself better. But what happens when people with competence get into this world is they think they have all the answers. I thought so for a long time. And I write about it in, uh, in, in this book where I talk about fetching water, the women fetching water and uh, uh, how, how, how he was made a fool of uh, you know, understanding water is a problem, but actually women and their privacy was their problem. And they never asked me to solve their problem. So, and, and I, I felt that being prescriptive is a dangerous commodity and competence makes us feel prescriptive. So my, my, my suggestion to all of us, and I keep telling myself this every day, never ever believe that you have the answers. For all you know, you may not even be articulating the problem properly. So learning to listen 
and that is why the i is small subsuming yourself into a space of humility where you say i don't know i would like to know and and going there with that openness to communities whether it's human development policy making or even management education now i teach leadership and i say i tell my student in the first day of class all that you can expect after my course is for understanding how to operate in zones of incompetence and if i taught you that i have taught you well and and i think we need to get that into our mindset because you know we always take this prescription positions and say if i am government i have to provide you now i have to meet people's aspirations but we never ask people what their aspirations are we end up providing what we think people's aspirations are so this 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 listening ability is something which i think we i i, I have spoken about in this book second is many times poor have no choice but real human development is not elevating poverty real human development is about enabling choice providing opportunities and allowing me to choose what opportunity i want if you look at a public distribution system i think i wrote about it in the voices book i write i write a story called basavi and social and food security you know we we provide a tribal who's never eaten rice in her life who only enjoys the millet that she was growing in her backyard suddenly gets free rice why would she grow anything now so she gets free rice and it's a completely new product and rice is possibly such high glycemic index we are actually cursing the woman to suffer from diabetes 30 years later her progeny to suffer from diabetes so we are creating a, a culturally alien atmosphere in this country in the name of elevating and fighting poverty culturally insensitive uh, uh, inappropriate measures that we did so i talk about culturally appropriate and contextually relevant development and that's something i felt um, i my my hope and dream was our people will start thinking about all this so whether it is people's voices no other has become a transactional tool today but other is supposed to be an identity for me and i i write about akamma who's confused she says i don't understand how my identity can come from a number and uh, how somebody sitting in a uh, taluk office 150 miles away can tell me i am akamma whereas my own neighbor can't tell me i am akamma and validate it because we have built a society of governance based on mistrust If you look at most Indian laws, it is made because it doesn't trust citizens to do their jobs. So we create so much of mistrust that we are uh, building everything around it. Whether it's a labor law, whether it's a regulatory frameworks, I think for once, if citizens start behaving that they're trustworthy, systems also start trusting them. So we have to learn to eliminate trust deficit. It's something I feel very strongly about, and that's something I, the undercurrent message I bring out in this book. I, I write about Maidi building a house. Or oh, the system didn't trust her to build the house. You know, I didn't trust her, but she told me, you know, I know what kind of house I want. And those days it would be twenty thousand rupees the common house. We somehow convinced the Jilla Panchayat, and she, her, the house she built thirty years later is still standing, and it is three times the size of what government builds. Government houses are built at the same time actually collapse and gone. And you need an architect, you need a contractor. She asked me a simple question: Why are you using asking me to use an asbestos sheet? the design that you give the state architect makes a type design and gives a 10 by 10 house she built a 300 square foot house and she used tiles and she said if one tile breaks i can take a bus and go into the city buy a tile carry it back home in my bag but if my sheet cracks what can i do will hire a lorry for me she said now this common sensical questions can be answered if you listen to the communities so these are some of the examples i spoken about whether it's citizenship and in citizenship i write about violent expressions not really being the answer i was a confrontational activist i sued the government i've done all that today i realize that is not it can bring me 20 minutes of newspaper glory but beyond that it doesn't solve problems so it is not activism that we need it is an understanding of synergy and partnership that we can build with all the players in development so whether it's a state whether it's the private sector whether it is civil society or whether it is citizens themselves learning to work together building on each other's skills is what good citizenship is all about we always end up criticizing the other i started my ngo life thinking that government is the is the, the worst thing that can happen to a society all corporates are criminals and i know it's unfortunate but that is the phase of my life today i know there is good in every system and unless all of us learn to work together you can't really move the needle at all today i am actually inside the government as a member of the capacity building commission i feel very privilege that i have a insider view now which is actually validating a lot of my outsider expressions that i got subsequently not what i started early in my life early in my life i thought i could supplant the government but now i know at best civil society can only supplement the government because we all need to learn to work together so various messages 
more importantly i feel we have instruments embedded in our governance structures we can't blame the system alone today we have so many opportunities of system society to capitalize on for citizens to reuse whether it's a mygo portal or whether it is a grievance portal or whether it is nominating people for the padma shri or whether it is sending uh, directly right into the prime minister's office or uh, getting inputs for his man ki baat program or sending him uh, talking points for the independence day sp speech for once we are now reach a system where citizens voices have been recorded and i was actually very impressed personally impressed that when 100 uh, uh, when 100 crore vaccinations happened the prime minister and all his wisdom said it is not just we the public sector who did it without the jan bagidari we couldn't have achieved it and that's actually true and i'm sure he believes in it and all of us should believe in it because without citizens participating that 100 crore couldn't have been touched not the citizens without the private sector rising to the occasion and manufacturing the vaccines this country deserves without hospitals delivering care that we all need to have without civil society reaching to the last mile in inaccessible conditions all of us came together covid demonstrated that sectors are blurring sectoral margins are blurring and there is no alternative but to work together and if we work together we can solve problems so i think the time has come for citizenship to be actually coming into action and for partnerships to emerge and that is that will be sort of my final message from the book that i would say we need to all think about and possibly hopefully resonate and take it forward thank you thank you so much i think there's so much to take away here um and the questions have already started uh, to trickle in uh, so i'll just go one by one you you know and then you can uh, take them in whatever sequence uh, that you wish to uh, so the first question i'll just first read it uh, you know verbatim if sarkar and bazaar have failed how will samaj become a collection of enlightened empowered citizens where they can negotiate the narration um it's coming from an anonymous attendee so I, i i can't say so yeah essentially i guess the references to government and market failures and then how exactly are we then expecting that the civil society will actually you know, See, make things happen yeah let's not combine citizens as civil society mm -hmm. and it's true that market failures are real state failures are real but i would worry more about state failures because uh, uh, state is a catalyst of human development state is a catalyst of policy making state is the one which makes policies and when state makes a policy uh, it affects everybody's lives whether you like it or not i want it or not that's a reality and and covid demonstrated is every country in the world state which had a good institutional framework or a fabric responded to it faster you now we might all criticize complain say 100 things about india and its public health response uh, let me tell you as a civil society activist as a public health expert as a policy expert india's public health systems delivered otherwise it would have been a mess mess of unimaginable proportion i can talk with evidence look at what happened in us brazil is still a mess australia is beginning to rediscover the problem israel despite vaccination is not sure what it's doing so we are all europe basing what's happening there so close the boundaries open the boundaries don't open all kinds of things but with all the limitations all the challenges the state delivered if state had failed we would have been we wouldn't even be having this talk today all of us would have got to some of us wouldn't be alive talking about all this so i think i would worry a little less about market failure i'm not saying it's not important don't get me wrong but i would prioritize state failure and i would worry about it and state failure can only be prevented by enlightened citizens there is just no other way and it's a long process it it is not control i'll delete you cannot press and say tomorrow morning things are going to be different we all have to begin the journey somewhere writing this book is one measure i train a lot of people i run workshops i go around i do walks i remember the long long walk i took about fighting corruption and, uh, and uh, prom promoting right to information was 420 kilometers through uh, close to uh, you know i i think i walked to met 2 lakh people to 120 villages and and, and there be each of us will have a different mechanism to do it but we have to build a strong uh, unified cohort of people who believe in this and every step every journey stop starts a small step i think i have done my part by starting the journey out i'm not saying i have reached the end of the journey each of us have to do it policy schools have to do it we have to get the narrative citizenship into the game convince them that we are not citizens alone we still operate at a subject mentality in this country we still think we are a subject of a benign crown except the crown has been replaced with elected parliamentarians we don't even know them to task for anything how many of us right let's say in this group 
Let's say I am Ahmedabad. How many of you even use the right to information? All of you are enlightened professors. How many of you write to your parliamentarians? How many of you write to your corporators demanding accountability and governance? So we all think the system will not respond. We all become so cynical, but we have never attempted to do something. The system will respond only to pressure. And the pressure can be created only by active citizenry. So begin, start with knowing stuff. How many of us can answer what are the eight primary responsibilities of a primary health center in this country? So if you walk into a PhD in a village, if you don't even know what are the eight things they're supposed to deliver, how do you hold them accountable? So begin with acquiring information. And today we have things like RTI. That's the first step. Second, start processing that information and asking yourself, what do I do with this information? That is where you start applying. And the response comes, you feel more empowered. It's a slow process. So enlightenment should lead to a, some sort of an engagement where you start res take, uh, responding to the system. And when the system responds back to you, you feel empowered. Then change starts happening. But this is a process you can't short circuit. And it's a journey which every one of us have to travel. Either you come yourself, bring yourself as groups, consumer activism happens that way, civil rights, uh, rights activism happens that way, tribal activism happens that way. But let us all not forget and make the government, let's not make the government or any system, the corporates, the enemy. Let us take the position that they don't know enough. Let me educate them. So I was a confrontational activist. But today I can say my attitude is to be a collaborative activist. Can I collaborate and educate academicians? Can I collaborate and educate government officials? Can I collaborate and educate corporate entities? Can I advise them? Can I tell them how to go about this? It's hard work. It's slow work, it's frustrating work, but that's the only way you can take this work. So I believe this approach is the only way to actually mitigate or minimize failure uh, that happens. But first priority should be state failure. And that's that response also faster. Market failures respond much more slower and it's got too much of vested interest in it. But state, let's also not uh, presume that states are not interested in people. The reality, states are interested in people. Governments want the state to improve. You know, every time uh, I hear the word ease of living or uh, citizen-centric governance, I really understand that Prime Minister believes it and wants it. So now we are the right political leadership talking about it. We are the right ecosystem there. But are we doing our parts? Are we actually putting pressure and demanding change? Are we asking our local people questions which matter? How many of us even read the budget and look beyond the cost of cigarettes, televisions or cars? Do we see the bios, uh, fine print and make a noise about it or reach out to people and ask questions. So I think let's inform ourselves. Let's begin to engage. Slowly we feel empowered enough to make a system change. I'm passionate Thank about it. Yeah. <laughs> are long. Um, so um, I'm again, you know, I'm just going to go through the, through the list of questions. Uh, some of it, you know, you've already addressed. Uh, so another question is, if we should not be prescriptive, then we should not be uh, preaching either or prosecuting or, or even trying to be politically correct. So how do we take this forward? You know, I, I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying we should uh, not being prescriptive in the perspective of saying that I have the answers, but we need to understand, develop the tools to co-generate the problem statement, explore it together and see if we can co-generate the solution because the people with the problem should be the people of the solution. I can't go there with solution. That's what is my life's experience. So how I would frame it is societies are transitioning. India had a situation where so many people are below the safety, uh, what you call safety net. They needed providing. We still, we have, we have moved on, but the political populism and then the political economy of the nation doesn't move on to grow with this. We have to move, get the government and everybody, NGOs, corporates, to understand that providing was necessary at a particular point of time. Maybe in a crisis like COVID, in a crisis like the migrant crisis. So you need providing. We can't escape it. But then providing should evolve into what I call provisioning, enabling people to acquire it. Like I had to provide healthcare by building hospitals to tribals. But today I would say it is not my job to build hospitals, but it is my job to ensure tribals are healthy. And that's provisioning, whether they get it through different systems, they get it to their own indigenous knowledge systems. Third is partnering. Can I work with them and say, well, there's a lot of embedded community wisdom and strength in what they bring. There's something I bring as skill sets and knowledge sets. Together, can we make life better for all of us? So I think the ideal state that we should all strive for is hastening this journey from providing to provisioning to partnering. And that is what, that is how, that, that is how we should work together.
that that is my way of looking at it and that is a political correctness i would say it's difficult it's not everybody loves populism right who wants to partner everybody likes to be the provider because it's so much a ego satisfaction being a provider but but i don't think that's true because look at the indian the millions of indians maybe you did it maybe gokul did it i definitely did it we surrendered a gas cylinder saying that if it's going to get a gas cylinder for another poor person in this country so we refused the provi providing that the state was doing a subsidy to us enable the state to provision it we actually partnered with the state in a sense it was our money which is surrendered as a partnership uh, uh, what do you call the an un un unspoken uh, social contract where the state that our surrendered money the others the poor will get it and that is exactly how it should be isn't it so i think we as a nation have shown that we can do it we may not have recognized it we may not be articulating in the words i am saying it but in several ways i believe i am a eternal optimist india is extremely it's maturing but we are all used to seeing the dark cloud so much that we forgotten to notice a silver lining expanding silver lining we have to wait until it becomes a silver cloud but that we may not be allowed to see it but the silver lining is expanding so let's start focusing on the silver lining which is expanding so to me it is an attitude it's not just hope and it is i can give enough evidence to show it's actually happening look at the way we have moved away into the dbt system i have been 5 years part of the lokayuka system the vigilance director i have seen corruption in its nakedness the postman takes 500 rupees to give a old age pension to a tribal woman he keeps 450 rupees to himself 50 rupees to himself and gives 450 to the woman and the woman for ever believed that a pension was 450 rupees she never thought she's losing 50 rupees today in her comfort of her home using a jandan card she can go and draw the entire 1000 rupee pension that is allotted to her and she now realizes that how much the postman is taking away from her in one stroke of the pen so much has changed for so many people and these are all advances look at the way upi is working in this country look at the way technology is enabling governance in so many ways well we were not a solved all our problems but haven't we started solving problems we have we have eliminated 1800 laws which are obsolete in this country nobody even spoke about it right so that's a step so i would always look at the silver lining i can keep quoting the silver linings but some of us have got so used to seeing the dark clouds we don't even notice the silver lining anymore and that's attitude thank you so much for highlighting that uh, yeah you know the what's what's called the what about re right so but what about this and what about yeah. that uh, i think we need to definitely change our attitude towards things uh, so a lot of questions have come in uh, maybe i will uh, read out a couple of them in one go uh so there's one, one participant gv ranganathanam uh, who's put uh, across a few comments uh, and questions as well uh, so uh, one of the comments i think he was referring to your uh, uh, you know your statement on how we still have the the the, serv the servant mentality where we think we are still being ruled by uh you know somebody and that's how we tend to behave as citizens uh so that's just a comment that uh, is being put forth uh, a question is i believe uh, um regarding your statement about being enlightened and informed as citizens so if we have to learn to listen to the citizens and learn to work together uh it is time that we give no importance to our television anchors and and celebrities so i guess it's also a remark uh, on our media uh, so i guess i would also like to sort of you know piggyback on that question is um how do we go about this process of enlightenment and and information uh what's the best source because seems like it's either media or we have cambridge analytica you know manipulating us in various ways so where exactly we are we in terms of being protected as citizens when it comes to information uh, veracity yeah, i think you brought in a very very current and a real challenge for policy makers like fake fake news is not fake it's real and cambridge analytica is just one organization which shut down but that's a tool which everybody is using today we are no longer predicting uh, we're not doing predictive analysis anymore we're creating predictive behaviors now So nudge is a dangerous weapon. Nudge might have got a Nobel Prize, but nudge is a dangerous weapon if you convert into algorithm and to sentiment analysis and start shaping your thinking. It's not just about your marketing powers. Data is information, uh, and that data is very powerful information, and which I can manipulate to my own reasons, whether it's an election or it is your buying or it's your living. So, what is the answer for this? This actually awakened 
personal existences, not the citizenship. You and I are not conscious and mindful about where we are getting led into and what we are asked to perform and behave in a particular way. We are never going to get out of this. So it is not just about state, it is our citizenship, it is also about our own personal lives. Now, how do we, that is what I said, I use the word negotiate very deliberately. We have to learn to negotiate with this ecosystem. I do not think we can escape from this ecosystem ever. The moment you get a credit card, the moment you buy a cell phone, you are trapped in it. As simple as the moment you are used to convenience of watching your emails on your phone, the moment Google tells you, how was your coffee on Starbucks, when you walk beside Starbucks also, that is enough. You have actually sold yourself in every possible way. So we have to be mindful and see what is it that we can do to minimize it. I don't think we can ever eliminate it. Now we have chosen those lives. Unless you become a digitally uh, insulated person, which is impossible, at least for most of us, at least, at least for me, I can surely say it's impossible now. We have decided to surrender our existence. But does it mean that you should surrender our independent thinking? That's a question I keep asking my friends. There's a difference. Well, uh, you, you can say, I don't want to get mesmerized by what Google tells me and what technology can tell me and saying, you may like this or you may like that. And why does Amazon only push four people? I can decide what I like. Now, I may use Amazon as a platform to buy what I want, but I decide what I want and not I have to listen to what they're telling me is better. Or when you bought this, somebody else bought this, they're also buying this. So we are seem to be living in a world of living our lives based on the judgment of others. Now we expanded the judgment to Facebook lives and Amazon reviews and stuff like that. Now it's a call you make. Every person takes an independent call of how you want to lead your life. And if you decide to lead that life, you can't complain. So I believe that um, media is a very powerful weapon. It's getting weaponized now. Everybody is using it. Big countries use it. And they call it by nice names and saying we're trying to lobby or uh, we're trying to change perceptions and we're trying to but relationship management through media is real but can we also be using it for other things can we use can we use so into criticizing social media can we say can we use the power of social media for policy change for things that we think are good enough can we actually uh, explore all those things so technology and human development technology and policy making technology and governance are inescapable but can some of us come together and say for every Facebook uh, algorithm to the right, at least nowadays you are getting one or two Facebook whistleblowers telling us how they're doing it. So maybe use them and say something, do something else. So I think fighting fire with fire is one way of doing it. Meek surrender is another way of living with it. Or saying that I will not allow my freedom of choice to be taken away, which is very difficult because we forget many times, but that's one way of doing it. Somebody yesterday was remarking to me, you know, this is on Goodreads and your book is on Goodreads. I saw this poster and I went and checked and I think I should read it. And I asked him why he said, because the rating is 4.4 or 4.515. I said, if that's going to decide you decide that you have to read my book, it's a very sad state of affairs. You should read my book either because somebody who read it tells you that it is good enough or you actually really want to know about citizenship. You really want to understand the subject and then you are exploring the five different places and then you find this is one good enough thing and you start reading it. So I think if you are getting led to make your choices, you are allowing yourself to be led. Let's not blame everything that's around us. So media is corporatized, is a real and corporate entities exist for their bottom lines. And power and corporates go together today. And so we must be mindful of that and say, how do we renegotiate it? So renegotiating with all these realities is what I think mindful citizenship is all about today. Thank you. So I'll, I'll take a couple of questions that have come in and seem to be related in uh, because they're referring again yeah. to your comments on governance and governance system. So the first one is about uh, capitalism and socialism. Uh, both have failed. Is it time to find something in between to create a well-defined and balanced uh, society and narrow the gap between the rich and the poor? So that is one question by uh, Kapil Anand. And again, a question uh, or a comment from uh, Mr. G. V. Ranganathanam. Um, how do you beat the odds of failure for governments? Great. So I'll, I'll start with Kapil's question first and then uh, you know, talk about, I don't think capitalism or socialism, uh, I, I wouldn't call, it them, call them as failures. I would call them different evolutionary steps that society is experimenting with. And uh, I would say they have not succeeded. 
that's a better way of putting it because all of us are benefits benefited by socialism the socialist structure of this country i i i could go to a school where i paid 1 rupee a month fees and but it is heavily subsidized by the state it is a grant aided institution where the state paid for it it's a socialist model now i wouldn't be where i am in life today but for that socialism i wouldn't be where i am today but for the capitalist world hiring me as a consultant and listening to me and trying to change their behaviors so i think we are all benefited but have we succeeded i don't think so so we have not i wouldn't call them failures so what is the next evolution i believe uh, and uh, there are few of us around the world who are trying to push the needle on that that the time has come for what we call the fourth sector economy the whole world to transition into a fourth sector economy if the state as a principal player of development is the first sector and they are the ones who push a first sector economy which is generally a socialist model keeping public welfare in mind the private sector emerged as a response to state failure and they grew sometimes in spite of the state like in india and the it sector and they are the second sector economy and that's also important and civil society like where which i belong to the third sector economy we thought both these are not answers to the world's problems equity is not going to happen so we can create equity but have we we are really sit back and ask so i think the time has come to study this scientifically and many of us have done it so what we believe is we need a new sector the fourth sector time for the fourth sector to emerge and kapil i think that's the way you get to look at it i've written about it if you google it in or if you see it on my blog i said how how it can be created we have actually created policies for that we have written and said how governments can transition to fourth sector economy how companies can transition we are working with a lot of corporates around the world in fact california state had actually would have moved if covid had not happened the sixth largest economy in the world if they move everybody else would have moved or at least started to move so we are all looking at taking the best of the welfare component the safety net component of the public sector the efficiency component of the private sector sustainability and viability component of the private sector and the public good component that or the uh, the last mile deliverable delivery that uh, civil society can do so take the best dna of these three sectors put them together and say create a fourth sector what we call a for benefit economy where we move away from the mindset of being a shareholder to a stakeholder where we are not anti profits we are saying the primacy is social intent but profits also happen so without without combining private uh, gains with public good we can't make the fourth sector happen there has to be private gains in, inspiring me that's what i gain from the private sector but i have not lose sight of the primacy of public good and how do i do it is what we have designed a model for it a lot of companies are moving towards it today i think in the us it's close to 8 to 10% of the economic uh, gdp comes from the fourth sector that is the way for this world to move that's the way for sustainability to happen we have that's the soulful economy i'm talking about so compassionate capitalism where shareholders transition become stakeholders and i get the benefit for the effort i put in so the value that i contribute to the economic chain i get a proportional benefit from it i may be a consumer i may be a tax payer i may be the owner of the company i may be an employee what i bring to the table proportional to that i take back the benefit and unless everybody benefits and if the consumer benefits quality is address accountability of the manufacturers address so many questions are address and i think four p's will emerge from this new economy first we'll take care of profits we cannot escape it we'll be concerned about people and so equity will be equity not equality we got to keep this in mind and the third is we'll ensure the planet is taken care of because planet also has to be a beneficiary now you cannot have benefits to yourself and no benefits to the planet and the last is if we actually make all this happen there'll be peace in this world so the four p's is what i think this new economy will result in coming and to answer the questions of uh, ranganathan i think uh, we already spoke about state failure but remember what is state success who has defined it where are the performance metrics for state state continue to exist in perpetuity it will be seen as a success so we have to really sit back and ask what is the state where is the idea of the nation state coming from who are the participants in this nation state how does the system operate so more and more look at look at scandinavian countries look at all this uh, look at the way switzerland functions and look at the way uh, norway or sweden uh, operate and the kind of democratization of ideas and development that has emerged so i think the more and more you can really bring down democratization the democratization of leadership democratization of ideas today ideas are just to preserve the elite few but are we really democratizing and listening to the voices that matter 
So I think if all these forces start acting together, that is the state and the change is already there. But then we push the state away something separate from me. So why do we separate? I, the citizen is embedded in everything. It's embedded in civil society, it's embedded in state, it's embedded in the political system, it's embedded in corporate structure, it's embedded in academia, it's embedded in media. It is everywhere. It's the community. So when, when, when that sinks in, when this global understanding of citizenship happens, then you'll understand that democratization has already happened. So my, my answer may sound complex and abstract, but actually very simple because we can't separate ourselves from the problem. You know, it's something like saying, uh, I'm stuck in traffic as a traffic is the problem. We got to recognize that I am the traffic. If I'm not there, there is no traffic. There. So the state is exactly like that. We can't separate it. out. You are part of it. You're embedded in it. You are as much the problem as you can be the solution. Uh, there is uh, there are two questions from uh, Mubarak Ali. Uh, the first question is good governance is measured by eight factors, participation, rule of law, transparency, responsiveness, consensus orientation, equity, inclusiveness, effectiveness and efficiency and accountability. So I, I guess the question is along all of these eight factors, what are the initiatives and challenges of governance in India? Uh, that is the first question. And the second is uh, about the role of the judiciary and the citizens uh, of India in good governance. So, uh, let the question be there. It's easy for me to see it when I respond to it. I think th you're right. These are eight elements that the World Bank has prescribed as good governance. And it's a good place to start off. With. I would say this is not an inclusive list, but it's a good place to start off. With. Now, uh, everything is a work in progress. Because if I'll give a small example, rule of law. The law says wear a helmet by driving a two-wheeler. How many of us do it? Law says stop at a signal light, which is red. We are staying at 11 o'clock in the night. There's no traffic behind us. There's no traffic ahead of us. I say, why am I wasting my time? Why not I move? So all of us have convenient ways of interpreting all this. And in my book, I write about governance and how each person interprets governance differently. I talk about how an old lady in a village interprets governance as a timely delivery of pension for her. For her, the governance means nothing else. That's what is governance to her. For somebody else, it means the big policeman not taking 20 rupees from him every evening. For him, that is governance. For somebody else, it means uh, ease of business. And for somebody else, it means I want to set up a company and it happens in 15 minutes or something like that. I'm just giving an exaggerated figure for that. But how do you interpret rule of law? Because we are all having, we have convenient interpretation. So most of our existence is driven by convenience, not by conviction. I think again, I come back to taking the responsibility on myself as a citizen. So the law is black and white. Either you are there doing it or you're not doing it. We build a house and we say five feet in front, three feet beside and all that offsets. How many of us actually do that to the, to the, to that point. And then when the revenue inspector comes and inspects and says, you're, you're, you're encroached and you're built more than what you're supposed to be built and you give me 5,000 rupees, we say corruption. Now you are corrupt in the first place. You didn't follow the rule of law. So I can, for every governance indicator that you take, you ask yourselves how transparent we are. How participatory am I? Am I really engaging in conversations affecting my life? How responsive I am to situations where I can be responsive enough. So I think Instead of blaming the government as something separate and saying governance is not happening, I ask myself and say, I am an instrument of governance as a citizen. And how well can I actually respond to this in this country? So my biggest challenge is shaking up people who are pretending to be asleep. In India, we're all comfortably pretending to be asleep. It is waking these masses and saying, you know what? If you are following these eight elements of governance, the system falls in line. Now, judiciary is an extremely critical component to do this waking up. But sometimes one even wonders if judiciary is awake. There's so many pressures and then they're always thinking about rehabilitation of post-judicial postings. So we are all in a world where the self has taken to become the dominant narrative rather than the state and my participation in the state. I, get, I got to be embedded in the state and not see myself as a state. Now that's what has happened. So we are all only concerned about myself, my growth, my petty visibilities, my petty contributions and benefits I give to myself. But if you can embed yourself as one element of the state, I think that's a good government. Whether judiciary or citizens, the answer is the same. So to me, each of us in a micro spaces that we operate in, 
the little clusters that we are belonging to can we actually bring in this element of transparency responsiveness ethics morality in our everyday life and instead of trying to say everything else is corrupt can we at least say i will try to be honest and that is citizenship to me and i believe that's the only way to approach governance also thank you um there is a question by raja bhattacharyi um what according to you must government ensure to have feedback mechanism in case for improvements uh, in policy implementation and do you believe that ngos can play a huge role in this and if yes then why is it not happening in you know as much as it should be happening see i think uh, there are several challenges i don't think just ngos i think we have to use every single platform ngo is one channel Uh, which we all have to learn how to use it. There are several channels: say advocacy and uh, ensuring that uh, your your voice reaches the policymaker can happen in multiple layers. It it starts from participating in elections and voting because you vote for a manifesto or a party or a person who says what he believes in, and you say, okay, this seems agreeable to me. So from that level, you start influencing policy. But then holding people accountable for the promises they made is the next level. now you can do it individually or through forums you can use the judicial mechanisms or you can use media you can write articles if you see all the articles i write in newspapers they are all opportunities for policy advocacy if you look at the speeches if you look at the youtube they are so powerful today why should you put useless tiktok videos when you can have 3 minute policy capsules which are very informative to general public so are we using all these channels so i think feedback mechanisms have to be created if they don't exist how many of us actually go to my gov platform and respond how many of us actually give inputs honestly let's ask us the millions of people doing it i'm not saying but we are a nation of 1.35 billion people so if you look at it in that number it's a small percentage so i think feedback mechanisms are getting institutionalized but only looking for institutional mechanisms before i start operating is not a correct way i would say create the mechanism yourself and today there are much much more opportunities so there are several several steps you can sit on the streets and uh, confront the government and the policies like what's happening the farmers thing you can go take the judicial route and say i will have judicial advocacy or you can take the education route and say i'll educate people to use this properly we have tried it in rti rti is created by the government but how many of us are educated how to use it what are the challenges what are the pitfalls and that's a way of doing it so ngos have a huge role but not the only role and that's why we think it's not happening in full strength but all these processes i would again say go back to what gandhi said i would like to use two quotes that in my life they have been gu guiding me you know uh, you have to be the change you want to see that's all i would say whether it's governance or whether it is feedback or what am i doing my bit the second is i go back to our rabi hillel's famous quote he says if not now then when if not me then who else so in so saying somebody else will fight my battles can i say it's me it's going to be now and i will create the feedback mechanism i will create the noise i will create the information spread i will use the social media for all this begin that way and maybe change will start happening everybody starts thinking that way i think change is a given uh, there are two comments from uh, mr ranganathan if you just want to quickly respond to those google facebook amazon definitely don't come under sector uh, fourth sector so it's a very easy answer and uh, i think question has the answer in it the fourth sector like i said clearly has to the primacy should be social intent i am not primacy cannot be profits they should, i'm not saying they should not make profits don't get me wrong other they never the, the sector will not sustain but the primacy should be social intent they can masquerade as fourth sector and say the primacy is social intent but we all know the truth and technology is god our institutions are medieval and our emotions are still in paleolithic age well that's your opinion so i don't want to comment on that okay um gopal are there any questions on the youtube live link uh there was one comment um nationalism and democratization need nowadays that's about it nationalism nationalism and democratization is a need nowadays i think yes there's no answer to that it is a nationalism let me make it very clear 
nationalism is not driven by political ideology nationalism not driven by uh, ideas beyond the nation state and a contributions to build a strong nation it is not about what i take out of it it's what i can give to this country to make it strong the way i subscribe to it for me personally it is what vivekananda believed vivekananda believed in a world uh, uh, which where india becomes a jagat guru and the teacher of knowledge and the knowledge of how to be peaceful how to live in harmony how to see every human being as god and not as a particular race particular caste particular color particular religion but just see divinity in everybody and operate in that space of thinking and then give this message to the whole world where he said even if a dog in this country is hungry then i think we have failed india and i believe in that is the nationalism i subscribe to everything that is associated with this country should be taken care of whether it is nature whether it's environment whether it's ecosystem whether it's people whether it is uh, boundaries whether it is our concept understanding of sovereignty and in all this in swamiji's we are looking at it if you have to love something doesn't mean that you would hate something else if i love my country i don't have to show that love by saying i hate other countries around me i i i love my religion but i don't have to say i hate any other religion that's not the way this thinking works so it's not it's it's it, that that is what to me is nationalism well said thank you yes um any more comments or questions on the live no no live no cast? questions okay let me come in later probably sure uh, so gopal did you have anything to add yeah i mean w- one point um i read the story of ratnamma in your book uh where you speak a lot about fdi and the impact of fdi um on the retail business in india now a lot has changed in the last 6 years uh probably you wrote this in 2015 and um, i think the journey has been a-, a lot more rampant towards fdi one such example uh, may not be directly about fdi but one such example was uh, i was taking a train ride from um, uh, mumbai to ahmedabad over the weekend uh, and took the tejas express and i was really amazed with the kind of uh, or rather pleasantly surprised with the service that they offer so privatization is happening and is definitely helping the country what's your view on this from from an overall perspective um, what would your thoughts be now with air india and the maharatna is also being considered towards that see from a policy perspective i strongly believe uh, government should not be in the business of business at all that's my pers- that's my personal belief now it's come too late so possibly let's look at it this way. i'll give a small example uh, if you look at the travel trade between india and the us passenger traffic right just india and us uh 1950s the private sector had the ability the bandwidth and the intent to run a top class airline that's why air india is considered to be number one in the world we ruined it because we didn't have the ability we neither had the intent we just had the spiteful understanding of tata should not whatever it was that's how history tells us right but my view is you didn't have the ability to run it as simple as that now you are accepted because your ability is in taking care because you grew up in an ecosystem where you are providing you pro that was important in the 50s right you had no bandwidth to say i'll manage an airline for the middle class of the rich you didn't have an idea so if the private sector was doing it so be it and if they if you could regulate it you could make sure the planes fly safe the citizens are safe you could make sure the airlines make profit and pay the taxes and that taxes can be used for the poor now we all have to play our roles in society and i think private sector has a role if they can run legitimate business which is beneficial to people now i believe that air india if you look at traffic today the uh, air traffic of passengers from india to the us is 7 billion dollars close to 7 billion dollars as an example i'm giving the figures might be a little more and then cut kind of covid and less than 10 to 12% is what is with air india mm. and most of it is dominated by a set of airlines from the gulf or from the middle east or from singapore and malaysia and they they don't uh, they carry the fuel from the they fuel up enough and because most of the cities in india are only 3 hours on those state places so they actually get enough fuel to fly back also mm. they pack the idli dosa in dubai and bring it to india and take it back in the same flight they don't even buy india food to give to indians 80% of the travelers are indians 
and there's no contribution to our gdp except for airport rights and landing uh, facilities they pay for otherwise they're getting we're getting nothing so if you're talking about atmanir bharat and all that you should start fly i'm not saying you should fly in a mediocre air india run by government that's why we avoid i used to fly by emirates or by etihad or by qatar not because i want them to make more money out of india but i wanted i knew that this is so inefficient and so blatantly problematic for me but i believe that if tata is a private sector take whichever i mean, just tata is an example to me they can run it better and utilize resources of this country the manpower the talent the resources and economic gains this country will get is phenomenal that is their job and then you pay taxes the state gets more money because you are good at spending taxes for social good do that so to me uh, is it a good option in the current situation for the indian context it's a great option but is it the only option for the world to go ahead i don't think so we have to explore the fourth sector economy and sure. move towards social enterprise and again india is a pioneer not a pioneer but an opportunity i would say it's not a pioneer sorry we have set up we're going to set up the social stock exchange no i can talk about it because i was in the committee which actually came together to set it up sebi has passed the orders now it's going to happen we are actually and 14 countries have set up social stock exchanges all of them have failed so we have the opportunity today to make a successful social stock exchange create an ecosystem for social enterprises to flourish move towards the fourth sector economy so we don't have to run the social enterprise as a government but create a platform like a stock exchange create the platform and facilitate loss for the system to take over and run it and just be a neutral empire a neutral guide a facilitator a trainer a fellow traveler in this journey and that's what government should do and i think that is the direction the government is taking and to me it's good news sure sure thank you so much great so i think we should close because uh, there are a lot yeah, of questions also exactly. yeah before i run out of answers <laughs> <laughs> no thank you so much this has been a fascinating discussion um and i truly appreciate uh, you and all our participants taking time today evening to attend this talk uh, so once again on behalf of the jsw school of public policy thank you for giving us this opportunity to host you and for everyone else to get the opportunity to listen to you thank you so much thank you Thank, thank you. you thank you gopal and please convey my thanks to paramol thank you yes so thank you thank you